Is that why you're early? Good. Well, we have about five songs, maybe six that we have to
it's that he forms us in the womb. Hmm. I guess I never was my own. So that? this talent or whatever causes us to get up here in front and do the crazy things we do, like singing, was never mine. It was always his. Amazing stuff, isn't that? Two eighteen, when he cometh. Two hundred eighteen. <laughs>
morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, hey, good to see you. Are we uh, streaming this morning? Yes. All right, thank you. I want to say hi to my family up in Alberta. That's a really cool thing. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Wallace Dick, and I am one of the deacons here. We have something interesting to talk about this morning, but before we start, I'd like to ask God to be with us. So let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we bow our heads today in respect of you and in recognition of your power. We also bow because we seek you and we have gathered here this morning to seek you with intensity and an earnest longing to know you as our friend and redeemer. We believe you want more for us than we can imagine. So we ask that here now, you reach into our hearts and souls and heal us so that we can raise our heads to you with the firm conviction that you are stronger than all the pain and confusion and doubt that Satan can throw at us. We need to know that you are a real Father, that you will take care of us and that you are gentle. Open our eyes as we seek to understand what you put before us so long ago. We ask for a full measure of the Holy Spirit this morning, and we are sincere in our request. Thank you, Father, for hearing and granting our prayer. In your holy name, amen. I love talking to my Father. I talk to him a lot. I have a need. I, didn't, I thought I was the only one, but it turns out most of you have that same need. I feel weak when it comes to God. I'm sick and tired of the guilt. I'm tired of not knowing all the answers. So since I rounded the hump of this life, the hill in the middle of life, and I'm headed downhill, I have nothing to lose. <laughs> I called my presentation this morning an unclear doctrine, the gospel, and I tell you what, I have had more trouble with this. I have rewritten this many times because it still quite can't say what I wanted to say. But I'm going to take a shot at it. The problem with the gospel for me is when I discovered this, taken from 1888 materials, Mrs. White, one of our church fathers, wrote this. There is much light yet to shine forth from the law of God and the gospel of righteousness. This message, understood in its true character and proclaimed in the spirit, will lighten the earth with its glory. Well, I already get that lighting the earth with its glory is really the glory of God, which is his character, which means the knowledge of him. But it also says to me that I haven't understood it. We haven't taken it to its far end, its logical conclusion. Review and Herald, November 15, 1892. This is shortly after the 1888 thing that we read about. God calls upon all who claim to believe present truth to work diligently in gathering up the precious jewels of truth and placing them in their position in the framework of the gospel. Well, I was stunned when I heard that. The gospel is the key. Everything else that we, that I think of as Seventh Adventist, is actually peripheral. Let them shine in all their divine beauty and loveliness. So it appears then that the gospel is the key to everything we as Adventists know. And we're real good about the doctrines. We don't quite get it sometimes. Some know more than others, too, even within our own church or within the denomination as a whole. I see those of you who are godly, who I judge to be godly. I see those of you who are having problems and who are struggling. And by the way, your sins, I've said this in men's group, I don't care. I don't care your issues. I don't care if you're struggling with something. I will never ever beat you over the head with it. 
ever. I've been there. Why would I want to hold your head under water? I mean that. So I want to tell you what I think the gospel is. And I'm trying to say all I can. I think he took every last sin that we will have ever done, that you will do today, and that you will do to the end of your life, to the cross. That's not what I grew up with. You think about that. That actually means that you're free. There's a group down in Loma Linda, I can't remember their name, they think that salvation is based on you asking forgiveness for every last sin. You at least have to say something like, God, forgive me my sins the moment before you die. But what happens if God takes you suddenly? He'll give you a half a second to ask it. This is in Loma Linda. It's embarrassing. And I find absolutely zero peace in it. It does not bring peace to my heart when I have a part of it because I know what I struggle and I look to a God who's infinite I'm thinking he should take on more role. I should give my part to him. Truthfully, I don't want any part that way in salvation. I'm just telling you what I think. And if we're free, it kind of goes back to Elijah's day when we get this, when he told the people, choose you this day whom you will serve. It's really pretty simple. and that Jesus did it all, and I mean all. And I think as an infinite God, I think he did even far more than we can imagine. Romans 5.18 Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. Hallelujah. Isn't that good news? I can feel the turmoil in me slowly subsiding. And this was Jesus' act of righteousness. Adam <clears throat> led us there, and then Jesus took it back. And it says, all men. It says nothing about if they choose him, they get righteousness. He saved all men. So the issue that we have to go into that a little more, because we have questions, practical stuff. You have to ask about what is it that God sees in you, and what about this deformed character that all men have had? I read this, I took it from something. God clearly sees that sin emanates from your nature and from Satan. The two things that Satan has or is or gives you. And he doesn't blame you for it. I had to think about that one for a while. See, I hang on to my sins pretty tightly, and I'm fighting, and I'm worried. But if God doesn't, if He actually looks at my heart, and He sees my desires, that changes everything. And there's a little side effect to that. <clears throat> Satan's claim that you have to appease God through obedience or gifts is nullified. If you look back at the Middle Ages, that was Satan's, one of his tricks, was to get us under a yoke by getting us to believe it by us having our ancestors. Romans 7, 18. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Now this is Paul. Good grief. He wrote the New Testament, no, the New Testament, most of it. He went from such a complete polarization from one side, swung completely to the other. And we look at him as being holy or a pretty good guy. And even he said that, I have the desire, but not the ability. And I think that's really the truth about all of us. And I don't even want to talk about you, that's the truth about me. It 
So I want to summarize that. Because I'm still struggling with this. Jesus sees your desires to do right, not your inability to do right. There's a difference. I want to let go and believe it. That's what he looks at in the judgment. That's what he looks at right now. He see, he's looking at an entirely different thing than we do. And I've also found places where that desire to do right, that's what makes you holy in this sight. That's also why he calls you saints. There are only two classes in the Bible, saved and unsaved by the end. He saw your entire life of sin before you were born. And he brought the cure before you were ever born. So in other words, he knows all about my life. He knows the struggles, the really stupid things I've done, the troubles I have now, the guilt that I carry. But he paid that ahead of time for me. That was profound. It changes who I think he is. Ephesians 1.4 Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. I used to read that and think, wow, I just really try hard. But I think it's different than that. I'm starting to see it is different. Now I know I've simplified stuff and a lot of you will have questions and disagreements, but I'm saying these things to provoke you. I want you to start thinking about these things because there are forces in the world that are soon to come upon us and it's not down the road, it's already around us. Satan hates this church and he hates anybody who loves God. That picture of the prisoners that were executed on the shores of the Mediterranean in Libya really got to me. You know, we talked about executions and people dying for loving Jesus. We talked about that from the Middle Ages, but you know, it's here today. And it's based on the same thing. Man trying to please his God. And if you don't believe the way I do, I'm going to kill you. I'll try and convert you in, in the meantime. But if you're ultimately set against it, I will end your life. It's here today. So judgment, I think, as I've said, is God looking to see what your desire is. It doesn't matter about the peripheral stuff that Satan piles on you. He looks for that connection first, and when you accept that, that grows, and pretty soon it will push the rest aside, and your character is transformed. It's all about him. It's never been about me. That's what he's going to do in me. That makes me happy. So the Sabbath then, oh, just as an example of how our, our doctrines fit around this, the, at least in one sense, the Sabbath is just like a little mini millennium you get to celebrate every week. We've got 6,000 years of man trying to do it on its own, or in this case us working and struggling and thinking we have to do it all to put a few dollars away and try and get a house paid for by the time we're old. old. And yet, we all look forward to heaven. The Sabbath is really a practice of what's to come. And when you, he has designed that path for us. So Sabbath isn't about Friday night when the sun touches the horizon. Sabbath is about truly letting go and spending time with him. And not only that, letting him touch you and me. It's different than There's a long transition period between accepting God and the full fruits of that. I believe that that will only come in the last generation of a tremendous trial, where they just do not give up, and it's only because of the power of God. And in the meantime, it's a stepwise daily walk with Him. 
and it's under his control, not mine. And I'm going to say this one again. God looks past my efforts at obedience and sees my heart. We've learned something new in our men's class, and I want to share it with you. At the cross, Jesus fused himself, I should say, actually, when he was born. He fused himself with humanity. I never really thought that before, but we've studied this, and it, it appears that this is true. He can't break that bond either. He chooses not to. I've often wondered why it was that Mrs. White says that he retains his human form in heaven. And I'm starting to get that now. When he fused it, it was permanent and it was for good, it was for better or for worse, like a marriage. When he said, I am the vine and you are the branches, he was indicating to us a simple example of something that was huge and beyond our ability to see. But he gave us something simple that we could grab onto. But that vine is connected to that branch. Period. So humanity is connected to him in ways that we, I don't think, understand completely. And then you recall from the New Testament, and I, I couldn't find it, I didn't have time because I was revising like mad for like the eighth time. But the text where Paul says that we're already with him in heavenly places. Well, that is, if we're fused to him, he has our humanity, so to speak. And he stands in our place, or whatever it is, however you see that, that would explain why he sees us in heavenly places. You can work on that one. And it, it takes away the fear of the judgment. I keep coming back to that. When I was a little kid, I was always afraid of what was going to happen at the end. Me and angry God. No. Judgment is simply declaring what already is. And it's based on that one tiny thing. If you reach out to him, if you acknowledge him, that seems to be good enough for salvation. For his entry into your life. For as long as you have life. And we'll come back to that. This makes more sense now. Matthew 11, 28. When Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and very discouraged, and I will give you rest. He was telling us that we are giving control to Satan when we don't believe. That all we have to do is stop believing Satan's lies about salvation. I talked about this last time I was here, Revelation 3.18. Jesus said, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich in white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. You also get from him salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. He is asking the Laodicean church, open your eyes. Now, I used to think that I had to work really hard. I had to say no to these temptations. I would fail, but I had to keep up, pick myself up again and keep going. All the temptations did was get worse and worse. It was like walking in a storm. But I thought that was the goal that he meant. It isn't the goal that he meant. In the light of salvation, that goal is he was the one who walked through the fire. And my goal is to believe that he did it for me. This is a much easier task, and quite frankly, as a sinner, it's the only one I'm going to walk on. I'm really bad to change in my life. And I've been struggling a long time. And he gives you credit for that. But I think he's also saying, you know, and it falls. Let me try. I can do this. Know that I see everything that's coming and I'm going to prepare you ahead of time. And I know your faults and your weaknesses and your strengths so much better than you do. such a hard time saving humanity. Why are we still here? I 
I think that's the answer. You are good, but we none of us believe it. We don't quite grasp that known truth. That reality, that grasping of what he really did, that can only come from the Holy Spirit. I used to think I could figure that out. I don't think we can. But the fact that we're questioning this now, that we're looking, by the way, it's happening a lot in this church. And it is happening in many churches throughout the North American Division. I've seen it. People are asking questions, what is it? And they're starting to see it. That only comes from the Holy Spirit. And it's by God's design. See, as we start to understand what salvation is, you start to understand something else. That if you're good enough for your Father, that His gift to you covers everything you could possibly do. And you start to look at the other side and go, okay, wait a minute. One of the best ways that Satan can control us, pull us back and influence our thinking is simply our guilt. He tells you that you're not good enough for your father when the truth you are. It's a lie. What's before us. And as long as we're afraid of God and think we have to please Him, we will never ever take that plunge into total trust. And what I think Mrs. White means about surrender is understanding this plus taking a chance and say, okay, God, I'm going to let you run my life. I can tell you I've been in the last year or two, I've been through specific things where there was no open door. And I was panicking, and I was miserable to my wife. You know, she has more faith in this area than I do. And I learned from her. She, because I was with her, because God put me with her, knowing that I would need this, if she could believe I did, because at least we were together on this. You know, God has never, ever disappointed me, not once. I have seen some amazing things, and I've told in the last three years, I've told you about some of them. I'm shocked, actually. He has answered all of our prayers, our deepest needs. He has shockingly fulfilled. If I was him looking down at this, I think I'd want nothing more than to show I was there, I was real, I'm ready to go. Put your foot on the gas, boys. Girls know they don't drive so well. <clears throat> I have to say it again. Faith is believing that you're already saved. Faith is not hoping. Faith is not something you make up. I say you, but I mean me. You're already saved. I don't even hardly know how to process that. See, when I get that, when that's my foundation, I want to be humble to him then. I want to meet with him often. I want to kneel. I will know and have seen that my prayers are answered, even the big ones. He, then obedience becomes so much smaller. I want to be obedient to him. I want to do everything that's in that book. Not because I have to, not because I'm trying to earn his favor. It's my natural response to him. And I think that's why Mrs. White said the gospel is the core of all the doctrines. If you want an interesting study, go to Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You know, I worry about all these things, but the truth of it is, my father already knows. He's got the good works. I don't even have to worry about it. Again, relief. 
that it also applies that he's running your life completely. He knows all your troubles, all your trials, all your stresses, your health concerns, your finance concerns, your friendship concerns, your kids, the works. He's got it all. So that brings me to this point. I'm ringing the bell for letting Sabbath go out, so if I go over, I'll just ring the bell a little later. Is that okay? When I think about these things, it seems to me that our job is to pray together as couples, as families, in small groups, and as churches. And you know that the most curious thing about that? One, you're connecting to the Father. Two, He reaches into you while you're in prayer to Him, and I'm becoming convinced that what He's doing is giving you a tune-up mentally and in your heart while you're in connection, which is why Jesus prayed all the time. He stayed in touch, and He never, ever let go of that thought. And the other is that the, it was so curious. Fascinated me my whole life. In the Pentecost, when they met in the upper room, before the Holy Spirit was poured out, the one thing that they did was they got together and they prayed together and they asked for forgiveness and they became united in heart and bond. And I thought, what a crazy qualification for getting the Holy Spirit poured out. But you know, the truth of it is, nothing kills a movement of brotherhood and sisterhood faster than its own members. Nothing comes from a rotten apple in the middle. It's easy, and that's what happened in 1888. I think God wanted us to see how full and complete His salvation was. He had prepared everything. We missed it as a church. And there are some pretty strong words. Man, I wish you guys would have got it. That's what He said. He needs us to be united as a church. He needs us to be united as a denomination. These things that our pastor is doing for us where we spend time together in these programs are really good. But I would still encourage each of you to form small groups, three, five, seven people, and get together once a week and just talk. Find something that is a, uh, a framework that, that will start your discussion, because your discussion will always shoot off sideways every time. And it's good. It's wonderful. And it knits us together. I can't tell you what it has done being a part of my men's group. I discovered that other people are like me. They have questions. Just absolutely amazing. That's why I'm up here, actually. I'm still scared of you. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> so God's going to write His laws in our foreheads and in our hearts. And his law is his character, and his character, as we see in Exodus when he talked to Moses, is forgiveness and justice and calmness and mercy and patience and strength. That's what he's going to do for us. I, I put this at the bottom. I don't know if you, what you think of it. I'm not a theologian. But it dawns on me that if, when he does that to us, then Jesus is obedient to himself. It's a complete circle. It's a unity thing. Save it for later. The reason why we're to take the gospel to the world, we're not supposed to convert them. That's the Holy Spirit's job. We just have to tell them they're free. But first, before that ever happens, we have to experience it here for ourselves first, in its completion. I can't tell what I don't know. Well, I'm going to tell you how you should be. You're not going to listen. <clears throat> I wouldn't listen to you. But if I see it in you, I will listen. And I saw it in you when I came to this church. And I saw it in Pastor Gary. I'm not kidding. I'm not trying to fluff you. I saw something that you guys may not see. Sincere people who love God. You are to be commended. Almost done. The other thought, I'm going to go to the bottom one here. It dawned on me as we've been studying that in heaven, when Lucifer was rebelling against God, he never yielded to God ever. 
And when Jesus came and put on humanity, he never yielded to Satan, ever. These two are really separated. Neither one is going to listen to the other. I don't know why, I just thought it that interests me. I think there's more there. So I will say this. I think Adventism needs a shot in the arm. I think that shot is the gospel and more depth and more study. Now, Adventism has changed, so that's not entirely accurate. It's changed since, well, it's changed a lot in the last five years even. Because we can already see this happening across North America. I've been in churches where it is profound. There is a holiness and a love for God that is amazing. And I think that those are the raindrops of the latter rain starting. So next week, we're going to talk about this from, through the eyes of the 1844 movement itself when this church was formed, what the gospel, what it was, and what it meant, and where God's goal was. Can we go to the very last screen? Slide. Let's uh, bow our heads for prayer. Father, you are the infinite one. Because of you, we exist in this universe that you spoke into existence. You gave us, your children, a place to start to learn about our surroundings, about the universe, but mainly about you. Our first ancestors chose poorly and we still bear the scars. And the worst of the scars is that we're pressed into doubt and unbelief even about you and that you even exist as a loving father. We have a long ways to go, but we ask that we are given the honor of believing that you are so much more than we think you are. We need you to be the father each one of us has always hoped for and wanted. We want to take that plunge into complete belief, Father. We understand that it is your standard and not ours that is the ultimate and only truth. Please walk arm in arm with us as we go now to our separate classes and pursue the truth that is you. In your holy and precious name, amen. For our visitors, we have discussion area here, here, and in the far hallway that runs this way. There are classrooms with doors open. You are welcome to attend any one.
Any prayer requests this morning? Yes. Friend whose son is sick. Okay. Marilyn and her children. And all of our children, right? Okay. Okay. I also want to play, pray for um, terrible with names. Um, Debbie and Gary Malone. They uh, had some health issues as well as as other things that have come up. And so we want to keep those them in our prayers. Anything else? Yes, Art. I know all our kids, but I want to spend a prayer for my son Junior. Okay. Yes. Yep. Thank you. Your friend Susan? Oh, her son. Son of your friend Susan. Okay. Let's bow our heads. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful today to be in your house of worship, to be able to have our petitions go before your throne of grace. There are many prayers for our children. Lord, they bear heavy on our hearts. We also pray for your Holy Spirit, Lord. We know that the Holy Spirit, as he comes into our hearts and minds, into the hearts and minds of our children, that our children might know you and that that they also will find a saving grace in you. There have been many prayer requests mentioned today, Lord, and we just lift them all before your throne. We pray that you might help us to learn more about you and your great love by having studied the lesson today together. We pray it in your name. Amen. Amen. Today, the lesson is called Words of Wisdom. Does anybody need a quarterly? Anybody need a quarterly? Let's do our lesson memory verse together. Most men, can you read with me? Most men will proclaim each his own goodness, but who can find a faithful man? <laughs> this paragraph and this sentence sort of reminds me of uh, cover letter and resume writing. Right? I, I used to have all the students uh, send me their cover letters and resumes. And it was always astounding to me how that students could promote themselves. Right? And it didn't necessarily mean that it was the best student who had the best letter. Does that make sense? 
And so it's an interesting thing to me because I always struggled with cover letters and resume writing because I never wanted to promote myself like that. Chalice names. <laughs> But how much better to be the person that is faithful. So what's interesting on Sunday's lesson is that we are all created equal. We learn in Proverbs 12, 20, 12, What does that say? What does Proverbs 20, 12 say? What does that mean about us all being created equal? The seeing, the, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord hath made them both. What does that mean, Mike? Well, to me, it means he didn't give us equal talents. Okay, he didn't give us equal talents. Some hear better, some speak better, some do different things. And, it, you know, he says that some have, are apt to teach. Well, I came from a family of school teachers, but I'm not sure I'm apt to teach. Tell us, you have some comments. After 6,000 years of sin, none of us is born equal to the other. We all have varying degrees of intelligence. We all have varying degrees of talent. However, we all know where we can all accept that the foot of the cross, the ground is equal. God loves each of us supremely. Very good. Thank you for that comment. What? Add a little bit to that, and that, okay, that is okay. that even our size is different now. Some people can sing better because their chest size is bigger. It resonates faster and more. It's just very interesting how sin has changed every one of us. Okay. But all have the same, we, we have choices. We have all choices. That are equal. I mean, all of you have equal choices, pretty much, to do right or to do wrong. Everybody has a... a um, I call 24 hours a day. Everybody has some, some opportunity, but the biggest thing is, or are we, the, the biggest thing that you have, we, God has given us is the choice. What are we going to choose? And we are equal on that one. Yes. Good or evil. Yes. Choose. There's none good but one, right? But with the effects of sin, we don't have equal choice. That's what Jesus came to save us from. The child born to a crack mother who was born of a crack mother who was born of... They, the, the choice of that baby has been taken away from them by their parents. But don't you think we all have the choice to choose God or Satan? I think that might be what he's referring to. Eventually. But some of us, it's a much greater struggle. I see what you're saying, because I know that some people are raised in a home where God is not mentioned, mm -hmm. where others are raised in a home where God is mentioned. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, God considers the day we were born. Mm -hmm. But when, none of us can do anything good, right? Right. So when we choose him, it is him living in us, the hope of glory. And it is through him that we are, our, our own characters are developed. Yes. To be like him. Yes. And which leads to this next, uh, next uh, verse is Proverbs 29. You guys can be looking up that while you listen to Chalice's comment. One of the things, though, that this doesn't address is that the responsibility placed on those who are blessed with a Christian home to take responsibility for the blessings we have and to be willing to share those with others. Okay. Realizing that yes. we have been blessed. 
Yes. And it's not of ourselves. <laughs> okay, Proverbs 29, what does that say? We can't make ourselves clean. We can't make ourselves clean. It says, who can say, I have made my heart clean. I am pure from my sin. Not one of us, right? Not one of us. Art. I think they cured like that. Pardon? Only the people that are on drugs are out there that think that Satan brainwashes them to think that they're all this and all that. Because I know when I used to be like that, lost and all that, I was thinking that, oh man, I look good. Look at this and that. And then this guy tells me, man, it looks like you got AIDS. Look how sucked up you are. Look how thin you are. But I, I, I look in the mirror, I see myself healthy and everything. But it was lies. Yes. So a lot of people out there, they think that they're this and they're that, but they're not. Okay. But it is true. I, you know, I come from a school where they teach you that from the administration to the instructors that you can be anything you choose to be which is not true. We can't be anything without Christ. Amen. Monday's lesson is the test of life. It's interesting, and if we start with Revelation 12 to 14, it says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. What does that mean to you? Excuse me, what, what, uh, Revelation 12, 14, 12 to 14. Revelation 14, 12 to 14. <clears throat> to me, it's pretty amazing that uh, parable, the Lazarus and uh, the rich man, because um, when the, uh, Lazarus dies, he goes to heaven. The rich, the rich man, you know, so look, I think in 19, dies and, and goes to hell. Once, I mean, once we are alive, we have a choice. And that's what's going to follow us. You know, we make a choice. I mean, that is hard to say, but actually every day, every moment in our lives, we have a choice to do right or to do, or to do wrong. I mean, it's, and so pretty much when we die, pretty much those choices is they were going to follow us because like the rich man said, Father Abraham sent Lazarus to dip his finger in it's too hot over here. Let me go back to my family, let me tell them. And you can't, once you are dead, everything ends there. You cannot make a choice. Death is the end of man's choices. Once we, but we are alive, we can touch ourselves and say, oh, I'm alive, I have a chance. I have an opportunity still. You know, as long as we are alive, God has given us, has given us a second chance, a second opportunity, billions of opportunities, you know. But we have a chance as long as we are alive. Okay, Art? Uh, you said Rome, uh, Revelation 12, uh, verse 14. is No, Revelation 14, 12, 14. I had to correct myself. Okay, okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. How do we keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus? Daily communion with Him. We can't on our own, can we? It is a relationship thing. And if we realize the power that He can give us, that's what I think is missing so much often is that we have a form of godliness but we deny the power thereof which is Christ in us the hope of glory 
that he can take our sinful natures and, and unite his divine nature in creating us a clean person, not just on the outward, but on the inside. And it's him that does the work, just like, like, like Jesus when he was on earth said, my father, he does the works. And when he does the works, he allows those works to follow us. Does that make sense in this verse? In Revelation 14, 12 to 14, here are the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And then it goes on to say, yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. It is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Jeremiah, Jeremiah 23, 25 says, and I'm going to speak this truth because we're lacking a little time. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this, that he knows and understands me, that I am God. Exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For these I delight, says the Lord. Then we're given the example of the man, the man in the cranium. Actually, it was. Let's uh, skip to waiting for the Lord. Proverbs 20:17. Red game by the sea is sweet to man, but afterwards his mouth is filled with the rabble. Who is this the father of lies? Can we have deceit and can we have righteousness at the same time? We cannot. Either man will serve, or cannot have two masters at one time. Sometimes we flip back and forth. I think. Now, this is where um, <clears throat> your decision comes in. We have, um, in order to make the right decision, no matter what it is, we have to study. We have to know what is um, right, wrong, and there's a lot of gray area. But if we walk with Christ every day, every moment, we will then be able to have the Holy Spirit come in and jiggle our mind and be able to discern which is right and which is wrong. How many of you have ever been spared, and I say spared, a future disaster by the Holy Spirit telling you this is the way of walking in it? really wanted this other meal. Have you ever been spared? I'm saying, when I look at my life in the past, and I can see moments in time where if I would have went where my heart wanted me to go and do the things my heart wanted me to do, that my life today would not be as pleasant as it is. And it was only through prayer and much struggling back and forth with some sin in my life that God was able to help
help me over resist that inclination and to choose a different path. And it has made all the difference today of where I am and all the relationships that are involved in my life because he helped me overcome a particular sin. And without him, I know I could not have done. Yes? You know, there is a text, I cannot find it right now, on Isaiah, that says the Holy Spirit will whisper in your ear and tell you the root, the, the right from the wrong. And um, that is, um, I was thinking about um, the comment that this person was making. He was making the comment that Jesus was a monotheist. He believed only in God. And when you go back, you know, um, I've been reading the prophets and the kings, and when any of those kings trusted God, wholeheartedly they were delivered from some nasty disaster or, or, or calamity or something. I mean, any time that they sincerely and if they search God, you know, Joe Rosa, I mean, I, Hezekiah, all these people, he, over and over and over, I mean, it's example to repeat and repeat and, and show that once you depend completely on God, that changes the whole paradigm in your life. Yes, when we completely depend on God, He takes us down a path that is much better than we would have ever chosen for ourselves. I think of even David in Scripture, where sometimes he would forget to ask God, should I do this or that? And he often asked God this or that. And then sometimes he would back up and say, God, I forgot to ask. You know, uh, it's, it's having that connection in such a way that because you are continually asking I'm God because sure of our own selves will walk out on the plank and, and that we'll end up in the water. Right? The thinking was, you weren't saying exactly And we think it's going to be so a great switch. To have you speaking something and me changing it to something else. Tuesday's lesson talks about uh, waiting for the Lord, but it also takes us to uh, if your enemy is hungry, Proverbs 25, 21, if your enemy is hungry, give him bread, and if he is thirsty, give him water to drink, for so you will keep coals of fire on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Again, the same thought is yeah, Romans you know, 12, right? 17 to 21. We pay no man one evil for evil, having regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it was possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will pay this for the presentation to you. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him, and if he is thirsty, give him a drink, for in so doing, you keep coals of fire on his head. Do you not be overcome of evil, but overcome evil so good. People's minds are just on that. Can we take this into a practicality? Is this one of the hardest things in this life? And I'm telling you that this is one of the things that really separates Christianity from any other philosophies in the world. Because there is no philosophy in the world that will say, be kind and loving of your offender. Yes. Gary. This kind of means a lot to me because uh, I figured it out. I was I have a couple of years behind on the first line, right no. now. All of us are standing and, uh, in the knowledge and just building on it. If I don't sure there, I don't yeah, do it every day. That's and how you can expect it voluntarily. I catch myself recruiting me and I figure one of the things I do to get even. It's and it's and, and, and it's Satan together. just runs rampant that. with you. And you'll be thinking that for hours or something. And then you go, what am I doing? You know? Uh, and then they're, they're stealing your joy, right? right? Well, it's, it's like you're here. Filling your head with a bunch of empty space, like you know, 
thinking about what you can do to get back, or, you know, I'm not going to let them do this to me, or whatever. And it's, it's really hard for me to pray for somebody that uh, I don't care for. I have to be honest, I'm the same, I'm in the same ship with you. So, this is one that I really, really struggle with. So, uh, yeah. you may pray for me, so. I, I struggle with it too. I struggle very much so. I, I always want to protect my territory and, wow, walk in my box and, <laughs> right? And we're out of time. I was going to talk about compassion for the poor. Did you go over a minute or two? Is that your is, way is anyone wanting to practice the... You made it on earth. But sometimes they ask us to stop so that people can practice early. Let's talk about the poor for just a minute. Let's I like <laughs> Don't make your enemies. And that is what they meet where the rubber hit the road. First, what it makes the, the Christian or not Christian. And Jesus was so powerful. Even he prayed for, for, for them, you know. And one thing that really struck me was when um, the mob came to grab him and Peter shot the ear off. He didn't say to him, hey, you know. Well done. No, he said, stop that. You know, don't continue. Don't make things worse. And he grabbed the ears and put it back in his enemy. I mean, that is an amazing love. I mean, when you do good to your own head, to your enemies. He, I mean, the guy that was, they came to Jesus, he was an enemy, right? After he was injured, you know. And, and to add on to that, how many things has God forgiven us for? And in the Lord's Prayer, it phrases, if forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And we're not willing to forgive our debtors. And the, the parable of the, the, the man that forgave the little and the other one much is comparison to actually Christ. And Clearly, I think that's one of the deals. He says, this is the line. If you can't forgive each other, then don't come to me. Go ahead. You know, I'd like to add uh, a few things what happened to me. As a matter of fact, we had a, I don't know if you call it enemy, it's too strong a word for me, but uh, we had our next door neighbor who apparently was just bashing us years, years ago um, in the email. And so all the things, it's all about me. The thing is that I finally realized that I don't need to be upset, you know, because why have more fuel with fire? So anyways, what I did was that uh, my, the rest of my family was just caught up with our next door. I said, look, it, you're allowing this person to get a hold of you because you're allowing them to get in. And when you get beyond that, that anger of yours towards your neighbor, then you're fine. So what happened yesterday, I saw her out in the garden and I said, hello, Terry. And so uh, just to be nice, and I think, okay, the Bible tells you you need to love your neighbor and get this, she's Catholic. And she, she says, I've been watching you guys. I don't to myself, I don't care. She cannot do anything to me, physically, mentally, spiritually, whatever it is, but I have God on my side. And so, I just, I just say, say, you know what, what? let the Lord, Lord take care of it. All we need to do is take it to our heart by just loving our neighbor. Yeah, yeah. And we should end with that. But um, I just wanted to say, without God in our heart, we can't be like that. And it's the power of the gospel that changes us and helps us to put on his righteousness he puts that on us, actually, because we can't take it on. He does it. He does the work. Just as Jesus says, my Father, he does the work. Without his Father continually living in him, Jesus would not have been victorious. And neither would we. Will we? Let's bow our heads. Dear Father in heaven, we just pray that you will help us 
to know you more, to love you. Help us to understand your great glory. We pray it in your name. Amen.
Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Happy Sabbath. This is a gorgeous day. I kind of keep looking at my watch, day. It's still winter, but uh, we'll take it. It's a, it's a blessing. We're happy for everyone who's here. I know others are coming to come and join us for our worship service today, but we just welcome everyone. We especially welcome those who are guests. If you're here for the first time especially, we, we hope that you'll feel welcome. In fact, why don't we just stand for a minute and greet those that are around. Let, maybe you can uh, shake hands with somebody or uh, meet somebody that you haven't met before. Let's just do that for a minute. It gives us to learn, to grow. Something that's coming up, you'll notice this insert in your bulletin, um, a delightful discovery. There will be a spiritual gifts workshop in a couple of weeks. So you might want to make a, a note of that. We have potluck that day, and following potluck, we have a spiritual gifts workshop at 1.30 that day. We hope you can be a part of that. You'll notice in the bulletin for prayer requests, and, and just to extend our our thoughts and our and our prayers to the Comstock family. We're praying for Doug and and uh, his family and the loss of his dad, Daryl. He passed away this week. Uh, Daryl Comstock passed away. There is a service planned here at East on March 7 at 3:30 in the afternoon. There will be a memorial service. Uh, so please keep the family in mind. And what I was told is that there are some little cards that have been made up. Just little cards like this that are out on the lobby counter. If you would like to send a card or a note, if you'd like to know how to contact Betty, uh, um, Daryl's wife, um, there's information of how to reach her. They've been in the community for years, and we just wanted to share that information for how you might be able to reach out to Betty during this time of loss. We are also thinking of Marilyn uh, Desenko. It's good to be able to pray for one another, isn't it? In times like this, we're so grateful for the blessed hope. Jesus is coming again. I'm so glad that this world isn't our home, that God has a place for every one of us, and particularly for those who are grieving, that they'll be comforted by that. At this time, Cameron, one of our students at Livingston Abbas Academy, wants to share something that is coming up, a special event at our school. Good morning, everyone. Uh, there's going to be a drama play coming up on March 5th and March 7th at Livingston Adventist Academy. There's flyers on the, the counter on, in the lobby, and next week there's going to be more information in the bulletin. Um, another short announcement. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Cameron, I think it's a dinner theater, right? So, so it's, it's something, something really, really special, special. And, and if you, you have, have any question, question about that and want some more information, information, call the school, that, that information is in your bulletin, call, call the church, and, and we'll have some more information in the bulletin next week as well. As we're beginning our worship, we want to sing a hymn, a hymn of praise. Um, it's hymn number one in your bulletin, or in your uh, hymnal, that is. Um, if you'd like to stand with me as we sing, let's sing to the Lord. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation.
morning. Um, as I was thinking this morning about what I wanted to say about church budget, it occurred to me that there's really nothing I can say. Um, so I just ask that all of you, um, you know, think about what you've, you, what, uh, how the Lord has blessed you this week, how He's blessed you in our lives, and and the um, and this family, this church family. The needs that we have are a lot, and um, I just ask that uh, you listen to God's prompting. Uh, so if the deacons could stand. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just ask a special blessing for all of us here today as we come to seek you, as we come to uh, to worship you and as we come together as a family, I just ask that you bless all of us. In your name we pray. Amen. for the children's story and if you could get your baskets and collect the money that people are offering to you there in the aisles that money goes to help the student aid fund at Livingston and it does need a little help right now so maybe instead of a one maybe a two that that double the amount just so you know every every month we collect almost seven or eight hundred dollars in $1 bills. We get to count all of those. It's lots of fun. But uh, it does help tremendously. All the little bits add up.
Well, happy Sabbath. happy Sabbath. You know, it was a bright, sunny day. How long ago did we have vacation Bible school? Do you remember? It's usually, what, in July? A long time ago, maybe eight or nine, ten months ago. Well, eight or nine or ten months ago, it was a bright, sunny day. And we had decided that for Wednesday of vacation Bible school, that it was sunglasses day. You know, you have different days there. You have wear a red shirt day. You have wear funny socks day. This was sunglasses day. And I was up front helping sing. The, we don't have pajama day, nope. And uh, I was up front, and I had on my cool sunglasses because not only do you want to look cool with your sunglasses, but it's also kind of bright up there with the light shining on you. You want to be able to see who's out there. So I had my sunglasses on, but then I went to help with something else. And I don't remember what happened if I set down my sunglasses or what happened, but all of a sudden, a couple of weeks later, it was a sunny day again, and I reached into the pocket of my car, and guess what? No sunglasses. That's right, no sunglasses. And for those of you who have sensitive eyes like I do, no sunglasses is, well, it's kind of tough. I, I like being able to put my sunglasses on, so no sunglasses. And so I thought about it, and I said, well, you know, I kind of have a simple faith. I said, God, you know, you know where my sunglasses are. You know that I need my sunglasses, so help me find my sunglasses. Now, that was nine, eight, eight, nine months ago, right? And so I was looking around the church, this was maybe two or three months ago, and I decided maybe I could find it in the Lost and Found. That's right, so I went and looked in the Lost and Found, and it's kind of dark down there. So the first thing I did is I found a flashlight in the Lost and Found, and I looked in the box, and I found some very interesting things in there. I found a horse. Now, is that going to help me? With my sunglasses problem? No. What about these? Do they make some reading glasses? Not going to help, but there's a pedometer in here. Some, some wonderful things. I didn't find my sunglasses, but you'll never guess what I did find. I found a pair of sunglasses. I put them on. Oh, sure felt better. I had a pair of sunglasses on because it was bright out, right? I thought nobody would notice. They looked it looks like I would have bought these, right? Right? I would have picked these out, right, Jonathan? They're cool. Okay. So, you know, I, I looked at those and I thought, well, you know, those sunglasses have been there for an awful long time. Maybe God is helping me find some sunglasses. So I, I put them on and I went out and I sat in my car and I said, you know, I don't think this is right. They're not my sunglasses. Maybe somebody will come and find the sunglasses someday. And I truly believe that God knows where my sunglasses are and that he'll either help me find them or tell me, you know, it's time to get another pair. This is wrong. So I took them off and I put them back in the box. And I went home. And a couple of weeks later, it was dark outside. So now we've gone from being really bright outside, right? Really dark outside. When it's dark outside, we take a flashlight to take the dog out because we want to see where the dog is. And we always shine the light all around our property to see if they're in the glowing eyes because I don't want to get attacked by a bear or a cougar or a deer or a wolf or something like that and I also don't want the dog going after a big mine so I always do like this. So I was looking for the flashlight. You know what? Funny thing, I couldn't find a single flashlight. There wasn't one here, there wasn't one here, there wasn't one on the table, there wasn't one over by my keys. And so I said, Jonathan, what do you do with the flashlight? He didn't know. So we have a little case, and I pulled back the case, and you'll never guess what I found back behind that case. That's right. I put on my super cool sunglasses. Aren't they nice? Sorry, my super cool sunglasses that I've had for years and years. And, years. and you know, the moral of the story is two things. Number one, being honest and even the little things is important to God. But number two, I truly believe that God cares about the little things in each one of your lives, whether you've lost a special pencil 
or an eraser, whether you have an animal that's sick, I truly believe that God cares about the little things in your life and he loves you so much and he wants you to help with those things if you pray to him and have faith. You can go to your seats. story. So I think we want to go to shout to the Lord. Shout to the Lord. This is a song that I'm thinking that many of you know, probably not all know, but hopefully it will be a blessing to you as we sing shout to the Lord. We're going to wait until we get the, there we go. How about standing with me? Shall we do that as we sing this first song? Shout to the Lord. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All my days I want to praise the ones of the mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, Tower of refuge and strength, let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing, power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength. Let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. Please be seated as we continue to sing. We sang this song a couple of weeks ago, and somebody mentioned, that's a new song for our congregation. But it, what a wonderful song is it reminds us who is at the heart of worship. Who, what, what is worship all about? It's about the Lord, isn't it? It's all about Jesus. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come. Longing just to bring something that's of worth, that will bless your heart. 
I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it, when it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. King of endless worth, no one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours, every single breath. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it, when it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. God's love is so amazing, such, such grace, such power when it comes to his love. Lord, I come to you, let my heart be changed, renewed, flowing from the grace that I found in you. Close, 
Let your love surround me. Bring me near. Draw me to your side. And as I wait, I'll rise up like the eagle. And I will soar with you. Your spirit leads me on in the power of your love. And I will soar with you. Your spirit leads me on in the power of your love. Call to prayer. It's actually hymn 71. If you want to sing with a little harmony, look in the hymnal. Now, dear Lord, as we pray, take our hearts and our minds far away. Now, dear Lord, as we pray, take our hearts and minds far away from the press of the world all around to your throne where grace does abound may our lives be transformed by your love May our souls be refreshed from above. At this moment, let people everywhere join us now as we come to you in prayer. For those that are able, please um, kneel for prayer. Wow, what a week, Lord. What a week to come and go. Thank you for this Sabbath. Thank you for this day that we can come and put our hearts, our minds, and our souls and rest them with you. Lord, we are all grateful to be here today to worship you as a family. And I'm thankful for the opportunity to share our relationship with you, with ourselves, and with each other, and reflect what it is, what it, not what it looks like to be a Christian, but what it is to be a Christian. And Lord, we... Uh, we just need to lift up some of the, our family members as they are struggling today. We have the Comstocks who have uh, lost uh, their, their rock, as Doug would say. And I am so grateful for the opportunity that Doug had to spend some time with his dad last week. It was special. He shared with me that uh, it was a great opportunity. Thank you for that. I just ask that you be with the DeSanco family. As Marilyn's sister has passed. Lord, we want to lift Don Palmer up in his health. And thank you for having Nick be here today. I'm glad he's feeling better. Lord, we lift up our school. We lift up this church. We lift up all those unspoken prayers to you. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
The song I'm about to sing for us this morning is not the only song I know, but it has a message that means so much to me every day. In addition to that, my godmother, who lives in Canada, had not been doing quite well physically. And a few months ago, when my wife and I visited her, she requested that I would sing for church. I did this song that has a message specifically designed for her. And so today I'm singing this song for my mom, for you, for the Lord, and for what it means to me. So please listen to the message. That's when faith is really put to the test. For the God on the mountain is still God in the valley. When things go wrong, He'll make them right And the God of the good times Is still God in the bad times The God of the day Is still God in the night For the God of the mountain is to God in the family When things go wrong He'll make them right And the God of the good times Is still God in the bad times The God of the day the God of the day is still God and the night. Hi. 
Have you ever had disappointed hopes? This past weekend was Pathfinder snow trip, and so a couple of us, along with a handful of Pathfinders, bundled up all of our gear and warm clothes and piled into a car and headed up to Big Lake Youth Camp. It was a wonderful weekend. We had gone up there, we had prepared for this trip with expectations of snowmobiling and cross-country skiing and snowshoeing and building snow forts and snowball fights. But it was warm and sunny and it was a beautiful weekend, but our hopes were disappointed by the weather because there was no chance of snow. I have a friend named Emily and Emily worked at summer camp as a camp counselor. One week she had a particular little girl in her cabin who was bound and determined that they were going to be honor cabin. Now if you don't know, honor cabin is something that is awarded to one group of boys and one group of girls every week. The kids are graded on how well they do their cabin chores and if their bunks are tidy. If you want to have a shot at Honor Cabin, you have to be quiet during campfires, on time to meals, and have the straightest single file line at roll call. And this camper was determined that she and her fellow cabin mates would do all of this and more so that they could be that cabin. It was getting towards the end of the week and Emily was taking her girls for a walk. And this camper was skipping beside her, chattering on about what they were going to do after they won Honor Cabin. And Emily, wanting to prepare her camper in case they didn't get Honor Cabin, gently said to her, you know, the girls in other cabins have been working really hard too, and we might not get Honor Cabin. I don't want you to get your hopes up. Her camper stopped skipping, put her hands on her hips and said, don't get my hopes up. No hope. What do you have if you don't have hope? What do you have if you don't have hope? I've been reading through the book of Lamentations. And in all honesty, it's not a very hopeful book. If someone came to me and said, you know, Macy, I've been feeling a little bit down recently. What I really need is some hope. I would not say, all right, pull out your Bible. Let's turn to Lamentations. That's it's not, not my first reaction. But even among the doom and gloom of Lamentations, we catch a glimmer of hope. In Lamentations chapter 1 and 2, we have learned about the author's sorrow for what Jerusalem has become and God's anger at the sin of his people. Chapter 3, we'll start in verse 18. So I say, my splendor is gone and all that I had hoped from the Lord. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. Not hopeful. But then we come to verse 21. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. Let him bury his face in the dust. There may yet be hope. For no one is cast off by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love. Even in the midst of despair and destruction, in the middle of the laments of lamentations, the last place where you would look for it, there's hope. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. For no one is cast off by the Lord forever. 
N.K. Gottwalt, a scholar on Lamentations, says that despite the dirge-like grief of this book, Lamentations' purpose is, in fact, to encourage completeness in the expression of grief, the confession of sin, and the instilling of hope. It was the early 2000s, and I sat waiting on a bench in the orthodontist's office. I was there to get my braces tightened and to get those little tiny rubber bands on each tooth swapped out for a more seasonally appropriate color scheme. Now, I know that this is a very exciting thing. Uh, my orthodontist at the time was nice enough, he knew the wait was long, and so he had a basket of trinkets there by the waiting bench. And you could choose one uh, to entertain yourself during the wait, and then take it home with you at the end. Now, being the early 2000s, the yellow silicone Live Strong bands were a brand new phenomenon. And they were wildly popular, especially in Adventist schools where they had not yet been classified as jewelry, so they were okay. And among the grab bag of cheap toys at the orthodontist's office were an assortment of these rubber bracelets. So I began digging through, wanting to find just the right one to take home with me, hoping my mother would not confiscate it on sight. They had words stamped into them, words like survivor, strength, love, and of course, because we were at the orthodontist's, smile. I, the band I settled upon was turquoise. I remember thinking that it was the best because of the word that was stamped into its plastic. It was more than the other words, hope. It meant more than smile or strength or even love because hope isn't just now, it's in the future too. It's concrete, it's something that is yet to come. And throughout scripture, both in the Old and New Testaments, we find a theme of hope. Something that is here, that is now, that is today, but something that is yet to come. Psalm 42, 5. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Psalm 52. For what you have done, I will always praise you in the presence of your faithful people, and I will hope in your name, for your name is good. Psalm 119, you are my refuge and my shield. I have put my hope in your word. Psalm 130, Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for the Lord has unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. Titus 3, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. First Timothy 4. That is why we labor and strive because we have put our hope in the living God who is the savior of all people and especially of those who believe. First Peter 1.13. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Time and again we are told, have hope. Hope in the Lord, in the name of God, in his word, in his grace. Hope in his redemption, his goodness, his faithfulness. Hope in his coming. Set your hope on what Christ has already done. Hope because of the cross and the empty tomb. Hope in the second coming. Hope today but also hope in what is yet to come. In the book of Romans, Paul tells us a little bit about hope. I like to think of it as almost an outline of hope. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. 
Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. When we believe in Jesus, when we have faith, we can have peace because of the grace that Jesus has given us. Continuing on, and we boast in hope of the glory of God, and not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. And perseverance, proven character. And proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Hope is the result of character and perseverance and tribulations. It is the, ultimately the result of faith. What I hear Paul saying is this, yes, along the way in your walk with Christ, there will be hard things. But if you persevere, if you keep going, if you keep having faith, don't worry about getting disappointed. Get your hopes up. Boast in hope because God does not disappoint. No hope? What do you have if you don't have hope? Martin Luther King Jr. said, we must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. Through Christ, we have a hope that is present in the here and now, but it also speaks of something yet to come. It is a hope that is not shaken, cannot be taken, and does not disappoint. There's a tragedy which has consumed uh, much of my Facebook feed for the past few weeks. Some of you have probably heard about it. I know that there are a few here who it has touched in a personal way. On Tuesday, February 10, a Walla Walla University student and former Big Lake staff member was riding her bicycle home from the university. Madison Baird, known to her friends simply as Maddie, was struck from behind by a pickup truck. She was airlifted to Seattle, where on Wednesday, surrounded by friends and family, she breathed her last. One of the friends we have in common, Matthew Cosart, was a classmate of Maddie's both in academy and in college. And he wrote the following. Knowing there is nothing you can do is the most horrific thing in the world. They've decided to let Maddie live on through organ donation. Many will be blessed by her amazing body. I believe God truly does hear and listen to our prayers. We have to trust this is his will. Maddie's death encourages me to look forward even more to the second coming of Christ. The day where there will be no more pain, sadness, or death. I've become tired over the last few days in the hospital, but not nearly as tired as I am of this sinful world. What do you have if you don't have hope? You would think that in the senseless death of a 20-year-old girl, there would be no hope. There are no words. Nothing that we can say can make it any better. But despite that, there is hope. It is a hope that Maddie's family and her friends have. It is with us here and now. On Monday, Maddie was laid to rest at the cemetery in College Place, Washington, called Mount Hope. It is a hope that reaches into the future and looks forward to a world without sin. A hope which does not disappoint. A hope that remains unshaken by tragedy. A hope which could not be taken not even from that. It is in this hope with the Apostle Paul that we 
can boast. Corrie Ten Boom was a Dutch watchmaker during the Second World War. She and her family were arrested for helping hide Jews and smuggle them to safety. She and her sister Betsy ended up in Ravensbrück, a concentration camp with a horrific reputation. But even there, Corey and Betsy brought hope. They were Christ's witnesses. In her autobiography, The Hiding Place, Corey writes that in Ravensbrück, we learned that a stronger power had the final word even there. Amongst the horror of the camp in the midst of a terrible war, they found hope. And they shared that hope with the other women there, a hope that was not shaken and could not be taken and was not disappointed. Their barracks became known as Barracks 28, the crazy place where they hoped. A few years ago, a friend of mine was digging through old books at a thrift store, and she found a signed copy of Corey Ten Boom's autobiography. The inscription in the front cover reads, Jesus is Victor, Romans 5.5, 5, Corey Ten Boom. And we boast in, the hope, in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. No hope? What do you have if you don't have hope? Hopes for things like snow may be disappointed, but hope in the glory of God is not. Hope in Christ is not shaken by the weather. It cannot be taken by war, and it does not disappoint. Get your hopes up. Hope in the Lord, in the name of God, in his word, his grace. Hope in his redemption, his goodness, his faithfulness. Hope in his coming. Set your hope on what Christ has already done. Hope today, but also hope for what is yet to come. Hope in the day when there will be no more tears or pain, no more death. Hope for the day when the trumpet of God shall sound and Maddie will meet Jesus. Hope does not disappoint. Get your hopes up. Let's make East Salem known as a crazy place where they hope. I'd like to invite Rick and Peggy up. They're going to lead us in singing. The first time I remember singing this hymn was at a general conference session. It was overwhelming, the sheer number of voices joined in lifting praise to God and claiming his promise of hope. I want you to listen to the words before we sing them. We have this hope that burns within our hearts, hope in the coming of the Lord. We have this faith that Christ alone imparts faith in the promise of his word. We believe the time is here when the nations far and near shall awake and shout and sing, Hallelujah, Christ is King. We have this hope that burns within our hearts, hope in the coming of the Lord. No hope. What do you have if you don't have hope? Please join us in singing hymn number 214, We Have This Hope. Please stand with us. Yeah. 
this hope that burns within our hearts. Hope in the coming of the Lord. We have this faith that Christ alone imparts faith in the promise of his word. We believe the time is here when the nations far and near shall awake and shout and sing hallelujah. Christ is King. We have this hope that burns within our hearts. Hope in the coming of the Lord. Pray with me. Lord, we have this hope. We hope in you. Your word tells us that no one is cast off forever. And that our hardships, they lead to character and our character to hope. There are requests and heavy hearts here today. We have health concerns. We have lost loved ones. We are weighed down by life's burdens. But today, at least for a moment, we put these aside and we place our hope fully in you. We boast in the hope of your soon return. Go with us from this place. Amen. Amen.